Jane Austen's Emma, thinking about Jane Fairfax. In this video I will um, talk about the plot um, that's, uh, as it surrounds um, Jane Fairfax and so in other words I'll be giving the story away so <laughs> if you haven't read the novel yet and you're still caught up in the suspense of Jane's story and you don't know the outcome um, this is possibly not the video to listen to um, at that stage but if you're at the process of the stage of analysing the novel um, and trying to think about it um, and the way in which uh, the different characters and their stories um, illustrate themes then this is not this is um, this is the section to listen to um, Jane Fairfax is um, perhaps in when one first reads the novel comes over as a slightly um, a slightly insipid character when we've got to the end of the novel, of course, we, we realise that the reason Jane has appeared insipid um, on the outside when, for example, Mr Knightley has a very high opinion of her and has a great deal to say about her merits um, and her very strong merits and um, in many respects her superior character and superior talents to those of Emma. Um, when we get to the novel we, we, we understand more why Jane has on the surface of it appeared insipid or that there's been a difficulty in, in interpreting and understanding who Jane is because a lot of what is actually really happening in Jane's <laughs> fictional life as a character in a Jane Austen novel is um, covert and hidden from the reader until late on in the plot. Um, so in this novel, again, as I was just implied by being slightly ironical, in this novel, again, the, there is a, a lot of interplay between reality and non-reality, between truth and untruth, between fiction and reality. Now, of course, the, the great irony of all of that is that this is a novel, it is a fictional story. But within the fiction, there is a lot of interplay between these different concepts. Now that's something that occurs to a great extent as well in especially Northanger Abbey. These, these themes and ideas are there to some extent in Pride and Prejudice um, as well. Um, so, to, to, to think about Jane Fairfax, to just talk about um, her situation in the plot, um, she is an orphan um, and she has no inheritance from her parents or her family. At this stage in her life that is significant for Jane because it means that she doesn't have a diary. And a diary at this period tended to be referred to as a fortune. And in Jane Austen's novels, there's a lot of very open discussion about what any given woman's fortune was. Um, it seems to have been quite public knowledge at this period exactly how much money uh, people, especially women, had. And um, I think it laid many women who had fortunes open to being married for their money and they don't always seem to have been terribly alert to this if Jane Austen's fiction is anything to go by. Um, but returning to Jane, without a fortune or without a diary, there is no um, additional inducement uh, to encourage a man to marry her. Um, and many men uh, who wished to maintain their social status and social standing just didn't simply have enough money or enough income in order to be able to marry and have the additional financial um, draw upon them of a family, a wife and a family, without marrying a woman who came to them with at least some money herself. Um, others could be really quite mercenary um, and deliberately so. Um, 
Mr. Elton is, is shown up to be someone who's not going to marry uh, with there, there being money in the picture, as Mr. Knightley um, says of him. Um, Elton may talk sentimentally, but he will act rationally, i.e. when he decides to marry, he will marry a, a woman <laughs> who has some money and some social standing. So the other advantage for a woman, whether she married or didn't marry, um, depending on how her husband, who would take immediate control of joint finances upon marriage, um, wanted to uh, work with the fortune, whether a woman married or whether she didn't marry, there was the potential to invest the fortune in government bonds, which tended to um, return um, a percentage income of 5%. So whatever a woman's fortune is set at, the amount of money, we can um, assume that it's invested in government bonds and the return will be at 5% per annum, by which we can work out her income. Jane hasn't got this to support her in being single or to encourage someone to, to marry her. Um, so she's at a double disadvantage, really, by comparison with many um, of her contemporary single women. Jane, um, dis dis despite the fact that she's not really in an advantageous situation for getting married, has been educated um, according to the accomplishment method of education, educating girls at this time, which was um, stated to be a type of education that would make women attractive to men, which would help them um, to find uh, resources within the home to keep their husbands entertained when they came home from work. And also, um, as Mrs. Elton is constantly um, talking about in the course of the novel, that they would have inner resources to keep themselves entertained um, during their sort of long days in the domestic con context when in reality they often would have servants to um, carry out many of the um, domestic tasks and chores that needed to be done. Um, so inappropriately really, Jane has been educated within this method. Um, a lot of people were very disparaging about this method of education, although it, it continued for a long time, really, through the large part of the 19th century, this, this mode of education, so-called education, continued for, for girls. Um, Jane is, though, fortunately musically highly talented, and this does make her marketable as a governess, highly marketable as a governess. And as the novel um, gets underway, um, Jane is having a little holiday, a little rest with her aunts um, before she gets seriously underway with finding a position as a, as a governess. However, Mrs. Elton, in realising that Jane is, is intending to become a governess, um, starts to get the search underway, rather against um, Jane's um, wishes. Um, and this is a, an aspect of being an unmarried woman and um, without financial resources, which is discussed in the marriage deficit video a little bit more extensively. The, the, the marriage prospects for a governess were generally not good. Um, to her credit, Mrs. Elton is looking for a post for Jane where she'll have opportunities to socialise, where she will be um, more on a, a, an even social footing with the family uh, that she goes to work with, and that that is a good quality in Mrs. Elton. She doesn't have so many good qualities, um, but she wishes to avoid for Jane that that um, element of social exclusion, exclusion which tended to afflict governesses uh, in their posts. Um, the main problem, of course, with Mrs. Elton's trawl for a position of, of, of governess for, for Jane is that the families that she's looking to place Jane in are hopelessly parvenu. They're very um, arriviste, uh, sort of showy, like Mrs. Elton, but, you know, with the advantage of a great deal more money. Um, in some ways, Mrs. Elton would appear to 
have married beneath the opportunities that she was surrounded by, given that her sister had married very advantageously. I suppose the point to remember here is that Mrs Alton was living in her sister's home and so would probably have felt herself quite powerless and quite sidelined and just desperate to get away and to establish her own um, domestic arena, even if it were a lot smaller than, than that of her sister and potentially those of other people around her. Also, her diary wasn't so high. Um, it clearly wasn't £10,000 because it's always put out, out as being, oh, in and around £10,000. So it clearly, clearly wasn't quite £10,000. <laughs> um, so this is part of Mr Elton's pretentiousness that oh, everything has to be at least at, at least a certain level. Um, so for the reader, um, you know, the reader understands that Jane's delay in accepting a position as a governess is to do with the type of um, social um, standing or attitudes of, of the families that Mrs Elton is looking at. Whereas, of course, this is a dramatic, an example of dramatic irony being played against the reader because the situation is really quite different from this, um, as we discover by the end of the novel. So, Jane Fairfax really is a model heroine. She's the fictional model heroine, heroine isn't she? Who um, ends up with the sort of complete um, lived happily ever after happy ending. Um, Jane, for the contemporary reader at this period was the immaculate heroine. She is modest, she's beautiful, she's cultured, she's kind, she's dutiful, she's retiring in many respects. She's an orphan. Um, you know, um, she is poor um, and yet um, she eventually um, carries off the Cinderella fairy tale ending, doesn't she? So she's um, the consummate fictional heroine for the period. She's gender stereotype conventional heroine for the period. Um, but she's not the protagonist. It's Emma who's the protagonist. Emma, the arrogant, bossy, interfering, at points dislikable, at points behaves immodestly. I mean, the, 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 the ideas that she expresses to Frank about um, Jane's involvement with Mr. Dixon are really, for the period, extremely crude. Um, they're very dangerous for Jane. If a rumour like that were to get out, it could absolutely ruin Jane's reputation, not just for getting married, but for getting a decent position as a governess as well. It's very spiteful of Emma to talk like this about Jane. Um, and I think contemporary readers would have found themselves really quite shocked that Emma, who's supposed to be, you know, a drawing room heroine and um, she's so well brought up and she's so beautiful and she's sort of the local um, sort of centre, female centre of society, that she could, um, if she's in the position of heroine especially, have spoken so um, really disreputably for Emma herself because, as I say, it's quite a crude way of thinking, but also in a way that could be so detrimental to, you know, a girl with whom she's grown up, um, whose, you know, social history she's aware of. She knows perfectly well that Jane is of a similar social standing to her own, but just through circumstances um, is, is impoverished. Um, but it's, so it's Emma who is not the immaculate heroine who actually has the role of the protagonist. So once again, Jane Austen overthrows the typical stereotype conventional idea of a heroine, i.e. of the type of woman whom it's possible for us to like and to admire and to wish the best for as an audience. She's throwing it over, as she tends to do quite a lot. Um, Jane Austen, uh, in many respects, 
um, an active campaigner for a wide gamut of women and women's characters to find acceptance in a realistic uh, and broad way in society. Um, so we come to realise, of course, that behind the scenes Jane is covertly playing for time um, in order for her engagement to, to Frank to be able to come to fruition as she um, tries to avoid um, the governor's positions that Mrs. Alton is finding for her. Um, and the denouement, again, is, is, is rather fairy tale. It's a, a deus ex machina, isn't it, when Mrs. Churchill suddenly dies and all the difficulties in the relationship between Jane and Franca just summarily swept away. Everything from that point forward is easy and they can get married and Jane suddenly becomes a celebrated heroine and she goes off to her own stately home and it's the biggest stately home of all the stately homes. Um, in the novel, <laughs> and all is well for Jane. But as I say, she's not ultimately the heroine. Um, in fact, for contemporary readers, and even for today's reader, um, you know, Jane's um, romantic prospects um, you, you know, her more likely romantic prospects were probably something um, that the contemporary reader of Jane Austen's period would have been highly aware of. Jane's eventual ending, Jane's eventual outcomes in the plot are, are not very realistic at all. It's a little bit like, you know, winning the lottery or something like that. <laughs> it's not very realistic. It might happen, but it probably won't. Um, and I think today's reader needs needs to be aware of the fact that Jane's the the outcome for Jane is quite unlikely, and I think sometimes Jane Austen exposes um, the reality of a situation by actually almost ridiculously taking it to the opposite extreme, which I think she sort of by by taking Jane's situation the real. Uh, the most likely realistic outcome of Jane's situation to the <laughs> extreme happy outcome is almost to highlight how unlikely it would be even a more moderate outcome from Jane's situation. Jane herself feels that um, the situation is hopeless. When she leaves um, Donwell Abbey in um, a fraught and quite frantic state and insists upon leaving on her own, um, she um, is casting away the prospect of marrying Frank. She's casting away the prospect of remaining in this society. She's really casting away the rest of her life, understanding that she's going to be a governess. Um, there's the potential loss of reputation as she moves on her own through the country she might be attacked or something might happen. Um, you know, so it's, she, she, she feels that everything is broken up. Um, and in those moments, I think that especially the contemporary reader of Emma would have felt, yes, this is how it's going to be for her. Because that's how it would have been for most people caught in that similar type of situation. We don't know at that time um, as the reader yet in the first time of reading that Jane and, and Frank are actually secretly engaged. The secret engagement, um, when it eventually becomes known, is, is something that is quite frowned upon um, by the society in the novel. Mr Weston feels that he has to, in some way, you know, um, exculpate uh, Frank for having had this arrangement. and. Um, he has to sort of stand a little bit on the fence morally about how other people might be interpreting it. Um, and in general, it's not terribly highly regarded, and Mr Knightley definitely doesn't regard it very highly at all. The modern reader, you know, may not necessarily um, have a great sense of the impropriety of a secret engagement, and it, it, in today's world it, it probably wouldn't really matter very much. <laughs> um, 
The, um, the problem with the secret engagement, I, I think I've discussed a little bit in one of the, in one of the other videos already. Um, the idea is, I think, that because two people are secretly engaged to be married, so their um, marriage being a very intimate relationship, they're keeping their contract to get married secret. So it could be that the relationship is a lot more, um, is a lot fuller, um, is a lot more intimate than would normally be regarded as acceptably the case for the engagement stage of a relationship. Um, so if a secret engagement falls apart, there may be a question mark, especially over the woman, about mm, how pure she still is, whether or not the relationship was secretly consummated since they were obviously engaged in quite a complex secret relationship together. How far did this relationship actually go? And these were important issues at this period in the minds of the society um, at the time. And women, much more so than men, were subject to these kinds of judgment. Um, we don't agree with that today, but that is how it was at that time. We don't agree with that today in European um, or what tends to be termed Western societies. However, other societies and cultural groups within Western society um, who that come from sort of not, not the European background um, may have very different views on these issues. Um, you know, so it's something that at all events needs to be considered and borne in mind in terms of how social situations play out in Jane Austen. Um, We see parallels to the secret engagement um, in this novel, in other of Jane Austen's novels, um, Lydia's elopement, for example, in Pride and Prejudice, Mariah's extramarital flit, which of course is a lot more serious when she goes off with Henry Crawford than um, Jane's um, secret engagement to Frank Churchill, Julia's elopement as well, both Lydia's elopement and Julia's elopement are more serious than the secret engagement that Jane Fairfax is engaged in. Um, but they're all disapproved of by the society um, and in many respects were <laughs> scandalous page turners um, in Jane Austen's novels for the contemporary readers. So Jane Austen's novels had, had a fair bit of scandal in them, a fair bit of, um, you know, so, socially salacious detail to, to keep readers turning the pages. I mean, I think she probably was interested <laughs> in the sales figures that came out of these um, risque proceedings that occur in her novels. They don't seem risque today, but they were at that time. Um, it, it's worth as well just thinking a little bit about the relationship between Jane and Emma, um, especially Emma's attitude towards Jane. Jane's attitude towards Emma might might be sort of summed up in a sense of slight fear, um, a sense of um, apprehension with regard to Emma's intentions towards her, um, and and a sort of guardedness because Jane must be aware of the fact that Emma um, is judgmental of her and does not like her. It would be difficult not to realise. In fact, it's becomes quite clear to us at points in the novel that Frank Churchill has conveyed has conveyed to to Jean what Emma's conjecture about Jane and Mr. Dixon is. Um, there's the spelling game that occurs where um, he spells the name Dixon and Jane brushes it away. She's very angry with him for bringing that forward. She finds it extremely uncomfortable that her reputation is being sullied in this way by Emma behind the scenes. He finds it a bit of a joke because he 
fully intends to marry Jane. He doesn't see it as serious. He's quite convinced um, in his rather sort of boyish, debonair, um, confident, buoyant way that, you know, it's all going to work out in the end. But Jane is much more alert, I think, and alive to the fact that if his his adoptive parents, especially his adoptive mother, finds out about their relationship, she will immediately demand for it to be ended. And if he's going to, you know, throw away his inheritance, how is he going to earn a living? Because he's a little bit irresponsible. He doesn't seem to settle seriously to anything, really, except his engagement to Jane. That's <laughs> the one respect in which he really shows himself to have some merit. Um, but for her, it all feels very, very tenuous. Um, and he really should not be encouraging Emma in those jokes in order to, you know, make it look as though they've got a special something between them. You know, maybe he and Emma are a thing in order to distract from the reality that he and Jane are a thing. Um, but Jane, I'm not surprised, is very wary of Emma once, especially once she gets hold of that story. And it's very unlikely that they could ever have been friends, although Emma tries to patch it up with Jane at the end of the novel. But I wouldn't see Jane as being able to ultimately overlook that level of disrespect. It is very disrespectful. It's very disloyal. Um, so Emma's attitude towards Jane um, can be summed up with, in social arrogance and a personal sense of inferiority. Um, She, Emma, completely um, overlooks um, the difference in her social situation and her financial security um, by comparison with Jane's. She doesn't see at all how Jane's personality may be more subdued and uh, much less confident than her own because of Jane's very, very different circumstances. And again, one only has to think of the way in which Jane is patronised by Mrs Elton to, to see vividly um, what, what that difference is. Emma can easily dismiss Mrs Elton if she wants to. Um, Emma has so much status and, and so much luxury, really. Um, it's said of her at her father's home Quote, she is always right, so, sorry, in, in her fa at her father's home, she is so always right, so always beloved. And that level of security is just has never been there for Jane as an orphan, um, always probably needing to mind her P's and Q's, at least to some extent with the Campbells. And Emma shows no humility over the privilege that she holds against Jane's much harsher fate. Emma just doesn't have any well-founded or well-thought-through sympathy for other people and their situations, which also comes out in um, her derision of Miss Bates um, at the picnic. But at another level, Emma is alert to the fact that Jane is actually her rival in many respects. Um, She's a competitor because Jane is such a wonderful player and a lovely singer. And Emma's never really put the effort into any of these things. Emma tends not to really apply herself uh, to, to um, sort of real um, intellectual work. Emma rather prefers the role of condescending. She doesn't have to work for her social status, it's automatically there. So it's a lot easier for Emma to be friends with Harriet, to whom she can condescend, than it is for her to be friends with Jane, whom she has to acknowledge has worked harder at a number of things than she has, and is consequently better. Um, of course, Emma comes to rue and regret um, the relationship that um, she has fostered with Harriet, because she comes to realise, contrary to her expectations, that Harriet might also be uh, competition to Emma. Um, Emma has to look at who she is and what her real merits are um, and how strong a contender she is from out of her own true personal self in certain situations and this humbles her um, as of course does falling in love. 
because she she realizes that there's someone whom she sees as you know probably um, more than she is, which is a common feature of falling in love. Um, yes, I mean significantly, Emma is constantly matchmaking for other people um, in the novel, um, and she she chooses. Um, for everyone that she match makes for, in her opinion, she chooses um, a desirable mate for them. Mr. Elton doesn't, of course, agree that Harriet is a desirable mate for him, but she's she's a very pretty girl. She's a lovely, she's a lovely girl, very um, sort of gentle, kind, sweet personality. Even Mr. Knightley is eventually won over by Harriet, um, who he doesn't regard as, as such a sort of flimsy creature as he had initially thought. Um, but um, there's the one exception to this, and that is in the matchmaking that Emma does for for Jane Fairfax, whom she feels for towards whom she feels a certain level of jealousy, and that is that she matchmakes um, Jane in a rather grubby way with her best friend's and, in a sense, adoptive sister's husband, and that is smutty, um, really, and sort of below par, I'd say. Um, yes, I think that Jane Fairfax is a very interesting um, character within the novel. I think that the depiction of an intelligent, um, to all intents and purposes, attractive and desirable young woman the this, this psychological impact of being an orphan um, at a time when being a, being a middle class woman um, and having that level of social status was not something that a woman could um, actually achieve or sustain really through her own efforts. It was something that had to be accorded to her by the male members of her family, Jane without a father, without brothers, um, obviously growing up um, as, a, as a child and a young person would not have had a husband because she'd been too young. So then all the kind of hopes for the continuation would be really placed on finding a husband but then the irony of all of that was that it was a very difficult um, position from out of which to find a husband. And I think that the way in which Jane Austen depicts the psychology of an intelligent woman growing up in this set of circumstances, this disempowered set of circumstances, is um, remarkable. It, it feels very accurate, it feels very realistic. Um, and it really causes the reader to think about this as a situation. And I, I think it's one of the ways in which the novel um, strongly suggests that there has to be other there have to be other pathways for women in life apart from just marriage. There's no overt campaign, there's no overt statement, there's no overt advocation of such a concept. But it's difficult to read the novel Emma and to look at Miss Bates's life and to look at the next generation Jane's life without thinking that Jane Austen at some level is making a plea. Um, for the broadening out of women's lives and prospects and education and their wider acceptance in society in more capacities than simply that of wife, mother, governess and, you know, um, sort of um, disused spinster. <laughs>